Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Drive Time. It is our educational podcast series, as many of you may be in the car. But the fantastic thing about this podcast series is you've got the ability to go back and share it with team members because we're going to share a number of different golden nuggets with you today. If you have a growth strategy in mind, well, hopefully this can add value to your current growth strategy. This Drive Time podcast series is thanks to the Professional Partners Education and our huge supporters at Hall Chadwick, Profit Master, iKeep, and Lloyd's Auctioneers. Now, I'm always excited to chat to new guests, especially when we're sharing information. And certainly, because most, I'll say most, we were just talking about this offline, but most of our audience are accountants. Um, it's what we do. We provide educational content to the accounting industry. And we're going to talk about a particular topic today, which is going to be a really interesting one. And it's something that's been around for a while. It's something where some of the rule changes, I, I, I was involved in it as well with a bit of a startup back maybe 10 years ago when it was first introduced. And I'm going to take you through with one of the experts in our industry as well. I'm going to welcome Andrew Antonopoulos, one of the directors at ABA Legal. Andrew, welcome to Drive Time. How are you? Yeah, good, Paul. How are you? Actually, you may be the only director. I'm not sure about that. <laughs> uh, I am the only director. I'm, I'm so Let... focused on golden nuggets that we're going to provide today. Yeah. <laughs> we'll do what we can. <laughs> That's exactly right. Now, we're going to talk about the topic of R&D, better known as research and development. And I think, um, look, if I, if I take myself back to maybe, I don't know, and you, you probably know this more than me, when it first got introduced, um, to me, it was around 2000 and six maybe 2007 and a lot has changed but before we get into that let's share a little bit about you and ABA Legal tell me a little bit about you Andrew uh, no, I guess a little bit about me I'll just comment on that R&D I think I would have been 12 years old when the R&D tax incentive was first introduced so my exposure <laughs> to it was a lot later yeah. Um, Andrew yeah I'm Canadian by background so came out to Australia about 18 years ago and um came out here to do my law degree. I had one of those wanderlust sort of education careers, academic careers. I worked in Belgium for a while. I studied across Canada. Um, I couldn't find my spot in my place. So found Australia. I uh, intended to spend a year here and I've spent 18. So it's been, it's been amazing. So yeah, legal, legal background. I'm not a chartered accountant or a CPA, but um, worked in accounting firms for, I guess, nearly a decade. Did my master's degree, focused a bit on tax. Uh, I'm one of those um, law graduates that was uh, very misplaced in the legal profession. I didn't fit into criminal law, family law, property law. So I was one of those rare, what do we call them, nerds that found tax law as my trade. <laughs> well, the good part about that is when you, when you think about, um, you know, when it comes to tax and law, you know, there are elements there. I know even... You know, our main supporters, Paul Chadwick, you know, they've, they've got some fantastic um, QCs, barristers, because there's stuff that mm. you need to take to the higher level. And a lot of the accounting firms listening to this as well that are a part of our professional partners education network, I'm sure they would use that. And when a client is in a yeah. certain sticky situation that needs higher level legal advice, well, that's where mm. they come to, isn't it? Yeah, we found ourselves, or I found myself, more in the opportunity side of tax. So not really sticky situations and tax controversy. And, and I mean, you're absolutely right. The guys at Hall Chadwick are experts in that field. Um, I worked more on transactional elements of, of tax. So whenever there was mergers, acquisitions, disposals, whether uh, expanding overseas, dealing with multi-jurisdictional tax regimes, that's, that's where I sunk my teeth into. And I love that. When I always thought about tax as a, an element of transaction, it, it can be anywhere up to to 60, 70% if you get it wrong. And obviously on the other end of the spectrum could be as low as zero if, if there's proper contemplation and consideration. So as an element of, I always loved getting in, in, involved in that and being a part of that. So that's kind of how I started out in tax was focusing on companies. Um, the individual elements were not as exciting and the accountants that prepare individual tax returns, uh, God bless you. It's just, <laughs> very high volume. Um, so we got more involved with companies and, and innovation and starting to look at entrepreneurs and those sort of disruptors and game changers where I kind of align really well with the entrepreneurs. So I've never 
loves tax. My businessman loves tax, <laughs> but um, everyone that I have met is very welcoming of a, a tax lawyer coming in to help them minimize that. <laughs> so true. So true. So mate, let's get into our topic of research and development. Um, look, it's been a probably been a massive one since it was introduced. Um, I didn't think you were only twelve at the time, but that's okay. <laughs> so <laughs> oh, it's early, early 90s when it was introduced. So. <laughs> oh, there you go. There you go. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not a twenty-one year old practicing lawyer. Well, that's not. right, because I was trying to work out. Well, you know, 20, 2006, 2000, Yeah, no, yeah. all good. That's good. Mate, um, <laughs> share, share share with us um, and our listeners too. I suppose, give us a bit of an overview, what it's about and what it covers. <clears throat> yeah, I guess. And, and we talked about that exposure to the R&D tax incentive that you have. I was introduced to it in around 2000 and, and I guess nine as well. Um, but it's been around for ages. I think as a history of the R&D tax incentive, my understanding, let's call it that, was it was largely limited to big companies, the banks, big mining companies, those sort of Big four accounting firms tend to hold, hold they, they tended to hold the space in this R and D tax incentive. And in around two thousand, I guess five, six, two thousand eight, they started to open it up to small businesses, which is where I think it's designed to support. Mm-hmm. So R and D tax incentive is, is what it's called. It used to be called concession, which is where you probably got involved. Uh, yep. In in a very basic sense, not to get into the technical, is um it's an incentive based in the tax legislation for companies with an aggregated turnover less than 20 million, which is quite a majority of the claimants, there's a 43 and a half percent refundable tax offset. And the way I try and explain that is if a company is in losses and we're able to access this R&D tax incentive, we can convert those losses into cash, put cash back into the company's bank account and largely design for that innovative company to reinvest that cash, basically converting their tax losses to either push their innovation forward, commercialize their innovation, do something with that cash that's typically not available, um, but for the incentive, putting it back in. Um, and that's kind of generally where the under $20 million companies sit. So I kind of explain it in that sense because it's largely designed for companies so that when you get the cash back, it's difficult to get it out of the company and into the hands of the individual yes. um, shareholders and, and other individuals. If you do that, you're obviously paying highest marginal tax rates. So um, largely designed to get companies innovating faster, to get companies innovations to market more quickly. And I always say the tax office is just trying to collect their revenue more quickly by giving you a bit of money because they're hoping mm-hmm. you're going to make mm-hmm. some profit off of it and they're going to they're gonna sting you on the other side. We all know that. That's exactly right. Um, and, and look, from, from my memory of being involved in it with a few of the startups that I was involved with, and, and you mentioned, did you say 43.5%? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I always had my brain, you know, sort of, it's about a, a sort of 50%. Has the, um, has the criteria changed? I always knew, um, you know, and it was quite amazing with one of the startups that I was involved with at the time. I still remember them walking around, you know, we'd, we'd raised them some capital and, I still remember the the CFO coming and showing this this check for three million dollars, <laughs> yeah. and it's like holy shit, you know that's 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 <laughs> that's a lot of money. And I think <clears throat> back then, and now I'm showing my age and grey hair. Back then, I think it was um, they would give you the check, and then you need to substantiate it. Has that? I, I think that's changed, doesn't it? Um, yeah. So they'll they'll write you the check. Um, nobody writes checks anymore, Paul. But they'll write you the check. <laughs> And um, very true. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it is a self-assessed regime, so they reserve the right, obviously, to to audit. We've got an Oz industry element, which is um, focused on the activities of research and development and compliance. Um, so they've got, I guess, the remit of making sure that what companies are claiming are in fact new and novel. Um, the outcomes couldn't be known in advance, and sort of running through the eligibility criteria. Yes. The ATO has a second element of, of, I guess, integrity measures where they're focused on what was your expenditure, what was the causal connection to the R&D that you claimed and, and was industry certified, uh, and a raft of other things. So not that you've got to substantiate it afterwards, but you need to be in a position to substantiate it. And the way that they focus on that is, did you keep contemporaneous records of your research and development uh, that you claimed? And can you substantiate that that research and development was connected a sufficient nexus to the expenditure you've claimed so you kind of do create your bit a bit of compliance risk um which i guess if you're aware of it you can address it at the time 
Yes. But the self-assessment regime for the program is designed like your tax returns. If the government wants to come in and have a look, they're entitled to, and you've got to be in a position to substantiate it. And if you're not, you do run the risk that they can disallow it and you owe the money back. Yep. Yep. So let's, if you don't mind just going sideways for a second, staying on the topic, it's what, what is not included in that? Because I know, and this is why I'm asking you, because I know that I've been told a few things and I know people have tried to claim a few things. And in particular, mm. you know, the biggest cost in any sort of development is people and salaries. Mm. Um, what's, what's, what's not included in the, the call it the grants nowadays? <clears throat> so I'd say generally we need to focus on what's business as usual. Um, so BAU activities and expenses aren't eligible. So things like product development or just the general running of your business uh, are often not eligible. Yep. Where a lot of innovative companies, they'll just have this opinion, they're constantly innovating and whatever they do is innovation. So we've got to be more focused and targeted. You asked before, how the rules change? The rules have become a lot more focused, a lot more directed and looking at your activities with a lot more, a lot more of a concise lens where previously it was a bit of a broad stroke around eligibility. So mm. we're getting a lot more guidance that are focused on those activities themselves. And that's where we get this BAU consideration. We're always conscious of, well, what's business as usual because innovation yes. should be different. Innovation yes. should be a, an opportunity cost. It should be at risk. It should be unknown. Um, so we're looking at what's not eligible BAU. Um, we've got a whole list of exclusions of expenses that aren't eligible. Uh, and the ATO has given us those and they're clear, but salaries are always eligible if the work undertaken by that employee or contractor was on the eligible R&D. So if uh, you're engaged a third party or you've got a CTO or you've got a chief innovation officer, yes. or you've just got this smart individual who's on your factory floor building some outstanding equipment. So provided we can link their time to their activities that we're claiming, then their salary and expenses and, and associated expenses are, are eligible. Yeah, so and I think that's the, to that, that connection. Yeah, and I think that's the, the, you know, you made a comment before that you can structure yourself. Um, if business owners are clever and they get the right advice at the right time, they can start recording all of that and prepare yourself as opposed to you start your business, you're unaware of what to do and your business as usual, they actually don't. The AU yeah. is so therefore what you don't know you don't know and then you're trying to claim things and you can't substantiate things oh, all, all of that and you add a layer to that where the legislation talks about innovation and hypothesis and scientific method uh, yes. which is inconsistent with a, a lab technician would call a hypothesis sometimes yes. what an engineer would call a hypothesis sometimes so it is it is an exercise for accountants and consultants to kind of merge those two worlds um, and I guess in the event you're planning for it and you're documenting it and recording it at the company level, I mean, that's a perfect world, but realistically companies do what they do. Um, you, you put in front of them this checklist of what you want them to do. And they come back a year later and say, I forgot about that checklist, but here's my shoebox full of all of my iterative designs, my CAD drawings, my, my code base, all that sort of stuff. So we're in this sort of regime where, innovation to the government and innovation in the sense of true innovation at a science level kind of need to marry up from a compliance point of view. Okay, good, 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 good. And that's, that's a part of these little, I suppose we spoke about golden nuggets. These are the little things that I suppose to our listeners, if you've got clients that are, that are considering, this is probably where the advisory side sometimes kicks in. And if you know clients are going to start doing this, start providing with the advice. And although you may not have all the advice at hand, that's where guys like Andrew and his team at ABA are, those, those experts that can provide you with that layer of advice. So it's good. Yeah. Talk and about and often the accountants, just yep. on that note, it, it's, it's a really interesting R&D tax incentive is, is complex. It's complicated. It's kind of couched in the Income Tax Assessment Act, but it's quite a, a unique part of the tax system. Accountants tend to get busy as we all know accountants tend to get their clients screaming at them they've got a lot of clients that are pushing on them so the experts in this field exist largely to support those accountants which is yes. just where i found a lot of the success that i've had is work with the accountant to deliver the good news that you might have this incentive work with yes. the accountant to work through the client to find that good news and when you're looking at that you're going okay the accountant identified this potential r d tax incentive myself or a hall chadwick or an r d expert 
got involved and the client gets a $700,000 check cut or it's going to be an EFT transfer into their bank account or the other part. <laughs> but um, <laughs> that's what I've always found in my career. I started really driving my client base and my career with the R&D Taxing Center because you're giving such amazing value. I mean, yes. Clients are in a tax loss and you say to them, those are useless until you start making a profit or I can get you back a whole chunk of cash, which would you prefer? And I always found the clients that you give money to, especially when it's non-dilutive and it's not dead, <laughs> they're always going to come back and ask your advice. That you're going to be the trusted advisor within a short period of time. They're going to they're going to love what you've done, and we're here to support the accountants to actually get that, deliver that, and be a part of that journey. One hundred percent, and especially, you know, probably over the last well, twenty years, and it's going to continue because the internet is such a massive part of what we do. So therefore. Um, companies are trying to automate. You know, it's no mm -hmm. longer that manual base. So they're trying to automate, which is innovation. So therefore, mm -hmm. you know, to all of our listeners out there, you've got the opportunity. If you are, if you're not, if your head is not buried in the sand and you're able to <laughs> look above it and you're able to talk to your clients and meet with your clients and strategize, then you've got the ability from a strategy perspective, say, hang on a minute, before we do that, let me go and chat to the team at ABA to say, how should we structure this first? And I think that's mm. what I've got out of that conversation. Yeah, absolutely. And, and we'll always take those conversations, even if it's not eligible. Even if like, for instance, the base eligibility, you've got to be in a company. We'll still yes. talk to a trust. We'll yes. still talk to a trust and say, look, you guys might've missed out because you're in the incorrect entity, but let's talk about if it's worthwhile restructuring to a company so your innovation can be done and you can find it in the future. So. Those conversations we always do at no cost and they're always designed to educate people. I mean, that's, that's our mission, the mission of my software company, educate people about the accessibility of the R&D tax incentive and make it less scary. Some people are quite scared of the compliance risk. It doesn't have to be if you're aware of what, what those um, expectations are from the government. Yeah, brilliant, love it. Now tell me about um, RegTech for the R&D, sorry, for the R&D tax industry. Uh, well, none existed until I really punted it. Yeah. Um, so RegTech was a word I learned as well. I didn't know I was in that space. Um, essentially got to a point which most accountants would get to an R&D consultant. So I had too many clients and not enough time. So figured there had to be a better way. I guess that's a bit of my background. I've always got to be thinking about why do we do it this way? Is there another way we can do it more efficiently? So I, I started out digitizing my workflow to try and get clients on an interface or on a platform in the cloud that I could start to communicate messages, emails, documents, compliance, all that sort of stuff. Um, and what I've ended up with is a nationwide reg tech that manages compliance for the R&D tax incentive. And we're expanding into Canada and New Zealand. They have similar, similar programs over there. Okay. So in that world, in that space, there wasn't much innovation i suppose in the service delivery for r d consultants so naive andrew decided i would start it and run into half a dozen brick walls before i found the, the double brick and just kept going <laughs> you know i think that's the that's the again when you look at opportunities with our companies here in australia and you know there's some fantastic companies that have been clever enough to to look at overseas opportunities we've got such a small market here but it's such a huge mm. market overseas and what we are, we, we tend to be quite innovative, um, you know, even a little country out to the, uh, the east of us in New Zealand, you know, they're, they're even more innovative with what they create and then we adopt and then they take it overseas as well. So it's quite amazing that, you know, that uh, so much comes out of this little region of islands out here, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. And I think it's just a way of thinking, typical, if I just stereotype Australians, it's, it's the, can we do it different? Can we do it better? I'm not going to yes. accept no as an answer. I'm going to have a go, which is, which is <laughs> not exactly saying I had to learn, but I'm yes. going to have a go and I'm going to punt it. Um, yes. Now on that same note, what I did find relatively disappointing, but it's growing is the VC market in Australia, the accessibility of funding and capital to these early stage startups or even, even post revenue startups is pretty limited compared to North America, um, Europe, UK. So this R&D tax incentive is one of those I really focused on because for those companies that, I mean, all of these, all of this innovation is always cash hungry. It's either going to come mm -hmm. from your savings account, it's going to come from your profit, it's going to come from your friends and family. Um, NVC is a private equity if you're lucky enough. 
the R&D tax incentive then kicks in and says, well, we'll give you non-dilutive, um, no interest capital that is going to drive your innovation so that you can go overseas and, and compete in the bigger markets. So for anyone out there innovating or anyone out there with clients that are in that innovation space, trying to do something, trying to drive change, I've always said go to the R&D tax incentive first. After that, you can go to the, the debt market. Even there's an R&D tax incentive debt market that exists where they'll lend you money against your future R&D benefits. Then you go to the debt market and find yourself some convertible notes or some safe notes. And then you go to equity. Equity is the most expensive thing to give away. But Australians seem to be so quick to give away equity in their company. So there's so many different funding mechanisms. And I always start with the R&D tax incentive and highly recommend accountants do that. Your clients will thank you five years later when they still have a significant control of their company. What a great point. What a great point to make because I think, you know, if you if you stopped and reflected on that one and everyone would stop and reflect that it's such a true statement just there. So again, hopefully if you're listening to this, you can sort of go, yes, how can I start chatting to my clients? And I suppose this is the this is the element. I want to go down this little road now in terms of you know, whether it's, um, call it call it business advisory, call it any sort of advisory, accountants and over the years, given my experience in the industry for the last 20 odd years, there's always a need or a drive for, let's call it, what value add service can I provide my clients with? Mm -hmm. Yes, I now have, um, you know, we've got Profit Master as a, as a supporter of ours as well. So, you know, Profit Master are providing resources over in the Philippines, accounting, financial advising, processing people. So we, we no longer need that back-end processing people to be here in Australia as well. So there's, to be, to be fair, there's no real excuse to be getting out there and not working with your clients to allow them to grow. So there's that value add side as such. Um, you know, the old sort yeah. of Macca's, would you like fries with that? It's always been around, you know, and that sort of led a lot of the, the, yeah. the thinking because we would always Most go through the drive through in history. Most valuable yeah. question in history. I love it. That's exactly right. So, um, mate, is, is there a way that you could sort of identify a bit of a value add service to the, the, the firms that are listening to this of how to maybe from a process structure system point of view? Uh, well, the value add service is, is should you wish to do so, start your own R&D firm, new service offering within your firm. So, so there's the immediate one, and we've spoken a bit about that. The other one is really just identifying that R&D um, opportunity and referring that to one of the R&D experts, uh, whoever, whoever is in the Repidex. And part of that process um, involves the accountant because we've got to be very clear on the expenditure, the tax effect of what we're, we're doing, the effect on the balance sheet. There's a number of things the accountants get to now work in an advisory sense alongside the R&D experts. Um, yes, because we, we certainly don't at ABA Legal Group take this away from an accountant and run it on our own and deliver it back. We engage the accountant at every step of the way. One, it educates them for their future client base. Good for them, good for us. Uh, and two, it gives them that base level knowledge where quite selfishly, they can start to identify and qualify opportunities in their client base, um, get the most value out of their conversations. So we've got yeah. the, the two opportunities there to value add for the clients. One puts a bit more revenue into the accountant's pocket and um, the respect that I thought is more of a passive referral tool well, where they can go directly into a software system that manages some of their eligibility criteria and the accountant can service that on a service level. Could be monthly, could be quarterly and just engage with my software in yes. a way that manages the compliance framework in, a, in an online environment and then we interface the accountant and the consultant um, or rather the accountant and the client uh, and then my software company sits underneath that for support wherever the accountant needs. I'm not sure right. about this. The client's asked about that. What do I do about this? So we put the accountant at the forefront if they want to be yep. that. Yep. And they've got a whole new service model that's not R&D tax specific, but it's that supporting governance element of the R&D tax incentive to ensure compliance. So that would be, so, so that effectively could be used as a call it a tool to identify opportunities. Well, I've been called a tool before, but in different contexts, but yes, we are. <laughs> yeah. um, and in that same light, we, we just got certified app status with zero. So one yes. of the major innovations I've seen in accounting is zero, like for how yeah. quick and easy and efficient zero became. So um, 
yes, we've got that ability with the accounting software now to start to do quite easy cross referrals, click a button, and then the R&D tax incentive and compliance is governed through Cinch, um, S-Y-N-N-C-H, as the tool to manage the in-year compliance, which then enables the accountant or the consultant to do the end of year logins. So absolutely, we're, we're a tool and an interface and a platform that, that's purpose built for the R&D tax incentive for clients, but also for those novice and those experts in the R&D tax space to be able to, yeah, get in, learn in a safe place. And we're there to support them because we're, we're what we call human centered, auto, human centered automation, which is yes. a new term I learned as well. <laughs> okay, good, good. And I think this is the, this is the great thing about, to, if you're listening to this and thinking about from a strategy point of view and, um, you know, it doesn't need to be a new company. It just needs to be a new marketing opportunity, I suppose, where you can market yourself. We're all, if you're looking to grow, and I obviously deal with a lot of accounting firms every day and every single, like even I was, I was in Sydney on Tuesday um, at an investor event. A couple of firms came up to me, started talking. They want to grow. They don't know how to grow. They're a little bit confused of how to position mm. themselves. Um, so here's a really, really good one. If you want to position yourselves as you know, and I'll, and I'll use your term before as an R and D service offering. And it's almost like you're, you're almost to a certain degree, almost white labeling what you're doing. There, mm -hmm. There's no, there's no real, if you think about it, there's no real expense involved because you guys are doing the work and then offering a the feedback. So um, it's more of a value add service offering that can be taken up pretty easily, especially if you wanted to position, position yourselves in like I'm in Melbourne here. So if you go to, um, there's a little bit of a tech hub, sort of that, that Richmond area is becoming like a, like a little tech hub. So you can imagine the amount of innovative businesses that are just sitting there, may not having the knowledge. So you've got the ability to do something that other accountants may not do, and that's be proactive. Yeah. And, and I guess there's two prongs to that. You, your accountants there would have their existing client base. And we can only communicate so much to that client base as accountants. We've got deadlines coming up, your boxes do, superannuation and all this sort of stuff. I really love that should one of the accountants in your network want to roll cinch out as a marketing tool, we start to actually differentiate the messaging to the existing client base. Did you know about this R&D tax incentive? We have a simple, easy, effective tool to support your compliance. Interested, reach out. So you've got this now value add content that you can mm. deliver through your client base. It positions you differently. Um, yep. There's a lot of noise in the accounting firms, their marketing, their messaging. Some of them are doing it exceptionally well. Some of them aren't doing it well at all. But we've got a whole campaign strategy at Cinch that's designed to activate an accountant's client base so that we start to generate some interest and inquiries back to the accountant around this R&D program. And then equally, we're there to support them when they feel like they need support. Externally, second prong, I love an accounting firm that'll go to market with one of these value added tools. Mm -hmm. We're in this space, we offer it digitally. We are one of the first to adopt an online tool to make your compliance easy. I mean, what I haven't mentioned is the R&D tax incentive is retrospective. So right now we're lodging claims for FY22. We're yes. asking clients for information around timesheets and reports and technical overviews that relate to July 2021. So what we're saying in the R&D tax space is we're going to come in and we're going to ask you questions a lot about what you did. How did you do it? Who did it? Where's your evidence? What's your documentation? I love the firms we work with and our certified partners at Cinch because they're saying, I don't want any of that noise. I'm going to proactively manage this for you. I'm going to set in place a framework for your innovation to go forward with compliance. And I'm going to sit here because I'm your trusted advisor and accountant and make sure that you're doing everything you're supposed to be doing. I'm on the back end just automating their journey and giving them the tool to deliver it. Yes. But that external messaging is really going to set, it'll set you apart from the R&D consulting world, or at least 80% of them. I run a proactive, forward-looking digital strategy for your R&D tax claim. If you're interested, please call. I think it's internal and external. Yes. Brilliant. And then you, then you start to also look at, well, who are the clients you're attracting? If you're getting an innovation client, you're probably getting one with multifaceted considerations, capital, share, holding, cap tables. You're looking at probably loans, probably Division 7A, probably all the, the fun stuff that you get paid yeah, for yeah, yeah. advice rather than yes. boring stuff, which is your run-of-the-mill Here's your financial statements. I did your tax return. Then it's the 
17 follow-ups to make sure they lodge it. Brilliant. No, you're right. You're right. Because the, the, uh, no, 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 it's fantastic. Cause I, I think exactly what you said, then firms should be able to resonate with because that's their bread and butter. Um, and that's why mm. that's what they enjoy doing. But at the same time, uh, and it's the old, again, what you don't know, you don't know, but it, there'd be, there'd be clients of firms out there that are reaching out maybe to other people when you've already got an existing relationship in place there. Maybe yeah. you haven't just asked the question. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I could go on for days about this, Paul. So you, you, you <laughs> ran in when you, when you need to. But yeah, that's no, good. Uh, it's good. And I'm passionate about the R&D tax incentive, just looking at debt and equity markets and this kind of non-dilutive capital source and the government's generosity, I suppose, with the program. It's a great program. Internationally, we compare in Australia very well compared to the rest of the world's R&D tax bases. So love to see more accountants rolling that out when they get their head above water and look at what's going on around them. Yeah, agree. And I think this is the, it's a great thing about, you know, I suppose they've got a lot of tax deadlines. What are we sitting here? It's sort of, sort of mid October now. So it's by the time we get through the next to the end of October, they've got to reach tax um, lodgement deadlines. And then oh, yeah. it's, then it's they, Christmas they, they deliverables, should, new That's right. Then you, another deadline. Yep, <laughs> yep. Yep. But if you can start having conversations with your clients in the next 90 days, I think that's the, the positive aspect to opening up opportunities for 2020 three which is not that far away um well, you can still talk to 2022 we're able to lodge those the deadline for 2022 is 30 april 2023 so we've ah. still got time for 22s and okay. um, and we're at a good time of year now and you say 90 days that's what i say you yep. can get a 22 claim let's look retrospectively guys we're going to be a pain in the neck but when we're doing that we're going to look proactively at your 23 and get you set up so it's not so hard next year so you've got yes. the ability right now to sort of double down 2022s and threes very true very true. Mate, is a, um, as we look to wrap up, is there, is there a, is there a sex, sex, oh, that's probably the wrong word. Is there a success? Wrong story? podcast, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to get that edited out either. So is there a success story that we could talk about um, in terms of just to, to, to share with the firms listening, how you may have rolled this out with a firm um, so they can sort of resonate again. You've, you've given them a lot of different areas around the opportunity, how to identify it, the marketing, the tool you take, you know, you spoke about Cinch. Um, is, is there something there you could leave in terms of a parting comment of how they can start doing this? Um, I think the easiest way, and, and it's the shameless call to action, is to reach out to myself, either through Cinch or ABA. Um, okay. But I think for accountants, Cinch is a really good avenue, cinch.com.au. And the success story we've got is they just keep rolling out because we spend the time to educate you about enough foundational knowledge of the R&D tax incentive as an accountant that you need to go to market. We then give you, and we've done this in about half a dozen Melbourne firms now, and we're another few firms in Sydney and a bunch of firms in Brisbane. We're only going as fast as we can keep up. But we then find that out of a client sample set of 100, we tend to find about 9 to 15 almost immediate inquiries around the R&D tax incentive, and we convert about two-thirds of those into R&D tax claimants. To the extent the accountants want to be involved, we support and encourage and, and sort of provide whatever is needed to get that over the line so the accountant can run that. And if the accountant doesn't want to be involved, we manage that compliance and process ourselves, and we involve the accountant along the way. So... The success story is, is essentially we've run both models. We've activated mm. a client base and we've got 20 to 30 clients within the first two months. And the accountants are saying, we're too busy to take this on. Will you just keep us in the loop? We want to know <laughs> what else to look for. And we want to know how this whole thing rolls out. And then we've had other accountants that have wanted to start an R&D service offering. They've used the software. They get a whole bunch of clients on it. And they start to lodge claims themselves as tax agents. Now one of the firms that we've, we've worked with for a couple of years, they went from zero R and D tax incentive knowledge or clients. They now run about 30 clients themselves and they've got a dedicated R and D resource. They use our tool for some of their clients. Um, the rest of their clients just get educated by our tool from a industry knowledge point of view, but we've introduced an entire service offering where they didn't have one. And we, I mean, the unexpected benefit was we took one of their young accountants who was just hungry for something different and threw him into the R&D tax incentive and said, learn it, young entrepreneur mindset, 
loved innovative clients, didn't like doing tax returns, rather than lose that young skill and talent, they've kept him, put him into a, a bit of a different service offering, and he's smashing it. He's loving life. So, I mean, across the board, I could talk success stories all the yeah. time. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. Um, it's just that little golden nugget as we go back to the beginning that once you see it, experience it, and engage with the R&D tax incentive, you start to think strategically about how can I deploy this? The accountant yes. starts to think strategically, how can I resource this? And I've got this reg tech now that's sort of non-competitive, just a value-added tool for the accountants and the clients that takes away the scary bits, takes away the, the ATO is going to come and audit, and you're going to owe this money back. It's like, well, if you work the system and the tools there to design you to work the system effectively, you should be going into the R&D tax incentive with, with compliance and confidence and understanding this is just part of my business. Treat it like an investor. Correct. If someone's going to dump $700,000 in your pocket, you're going to do some stuff. Correct. Um, private equity is going to make you do some stuff. Venture capital is going to expect you to do some stuff. And friends and yeah. family are going to hope you do some stuff. But yeah. Yeah. Treat, treat the government the same way. They're about to give you a big check. So do the things you would do that an investor would expect because essentially the government's an investor in your business. That's exactly right. Well, mate, I don't know um, if I hit on that success story. No, but... no, 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 brilliant. Because I, I think there's enough there that, you know, I've, I've just written down a whole heap of notes this then. And it's um, the ability to just, again, learn from what you're saying and, and the ease. And I also had a look at cinch.com.au just then. And uh, I, I, yeah, when it's, and you also mentioned it's, it's when you're working with zero as well. So things are just going to get easily, more easily automated, which is going to help mm -hmm. any of you firms out there listening to this to think about, right, if I'm looking for something new and different and innovative, well, let's chat to cinch.com.au, let's chat to Andrew at ABA and let's, it's, mm -hmm. let's see how this could work for my firm, my clients and the future growth of the company. So but I want to thank you. Thank you. Um, you know, we've probably gone a little bit longer than what we had, but I think the uh, the ability to continue to share those stories has been fantastic. So, you know, again, fantastic to have your knowledge, your expertise. Um, obviously, you've got that link between tax and legal, which, again, goes very nicely. And I think all of mm. you that have sort of been listening to this, hopefully, again, you can rewind, share this with your team, work out and turn around and say, right, if we listen to this, can we develop a strategy that can move forward for all of our clients for the 23 calendar year? And the answer has got to be yes, uh, which is mm. how you do it. So certainly reach out to Andrew. Um, mate, uh, so cinch.com.au or what do ABA you know, LinkedIn? Group. ABA LinkedIn.com.au. LinkedIn. I mean, we're everywhere these days. Yeah. If you're, if you're looking for me, you'll find me. <laughs> <laughs> very true. Very true. All right, mate. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, um, it's, it's, it's been fantastic and, you know, another great episode of Drive Time. So look out for our next episode as we continue to bring you some educational tools and some thought-provoking ideas to continue to grow your accounting firm. So, Andrew, thanks again and Thank enjoy you. the rest of your day. You too. Thanks, Paul. Thank you.